Hello everyone. I am extremely pleased to be with you in spirit, if not in person. I've also been extremely pleased to be part of the preparation for this symposium. Rarely have I seen so much thought, so much meaningful communication, so much energy going into the preparation of a symposium. So I'm really confident that you will come up with very interesting discussions and very useful change uh, inducing uh, conclusions. My name is Siri Tellier and I am the Senior Reproductive Health Advisor for Womena and I am also a lecturer at the University of Copenhagen in a variety of functions. Now the logo for this conference is the one we have borrowed which is I think a brilliant idea with the drop in the middle and then the SDGs uh, around it which is a framework for uh, analysis to see how the, all the, the uh, linkages are and also a possible framework for action where you can see who should be doing what in uh, working together towards a common goal. Now I shall be concentrating on the linkages between menstrual health and reproductive health in the um, presentation. Now a little bit about the approach to the paper. We were asked to do a very broad discussion paper, and when I say we, I mean the knowledge management team of Womena. Womena is an NGO working in uh, Uganda with sustainable and innovative solutions to the whole issue of menstruation. And we have a knowledge management team that is building on and developing the knowledge that we need for the evidence base. Now, it's broad. That means we have taken the approach of a spreading a net wide, seeing what fish come in, and then it's up to you to decide which ones to fry. So it's a discussion paper, that means it's up for discussion. The other thing is that we have um, used as a basis the International Conference on Population and Development, that wonderful program of action from 1994, which has been reiterated in the Sustainable Development Goals, so it's still very much a live document. And two of the principles are particularly important. One is the life course approach. That means you're not only interested in the moment that a woman does or does not get pregnant, you're interested in the whole life course. And the second one is the um, concept of informed choice. Informed choice are two very innocent little words, but with enormous implications if you take them seriously. And I do. So that's what I'll come back to in the rest of the uh, presentation. Now, five points. One is with respect to indicators and concepts. And many in the room have, um, and Marnie and Julie and, and Penny and many others, have identified this as a major barrier to arriving at really good evidence. And I couldn't agree with you more. Without um, agreement on meaningful uh, indicators, for example, it's very difficult to build an evidence base and it's also impossible to get into the sustainable development goals. And it would be very helpful to have uh, very precise um, definitions of a concept like hygienic approaches. We need you, WHO, to help us you know, with uh, the different kinds of what is included in this thing, a hygienic approach. One thing I thought uh, we could do is to draw a little bit of a parallel with what happened in family planning. I've been working with reproductive health for 50 years, since 1968, studying or working with reproductive health. And I can assure you, uh, it, when we started, there were enormous challenges. It was seen as extremely controversial. Remember that even in France, the year before 1967, it was illegal until 1967 to use modern means of contraception. So quite a lot of disagreement and cultural discussions. Is it culturally acceptable, this religion, that religion? So a lot of, of lack of clarity um, and not very much nuancing. And in that, um, some of the um, uh, important things were to develop indicators that could make meaning out of all this mess. And one of those indicators was unmet need for family planning. Unmet need means the difference between how many women need family planning, in quotation marks, and how many are using them. It took several decades before we arrived 
at a, an indicator which was well defined, which you had the right questions to ask from the women, I think it takes four or five questions, and you had a, a um, system for collecting the evidence, in this case, usually the demographic health surveys. And still it took until 2007, not the first version of the Millennium Development Goals, but the second version in 2007, before they were, that particular indicator was included. And yet um, today, um, in the Sustainable Development Goals, it's also there, but some countries like Denmark, they are not collecting this kind of data. So they had to scratch their heads to figure out how were they going to put together the answer to that question. So it just seems to me that uh, possibly some of this, these indicators, both the process by which they came up as useful indicators in the SDG and the content. You have many others. You have prevalence, you have method mix, you have satisfaction levels according to the Likert scale. scale. You have all kinds of other metrics that are tried and true that might be useful. Second point is with regard to menarche and menarche education. Uh, I think there's pretty good evidence that uh, girls arrive at menarche with low levels of knowledge and high levels of shame and fear. And yes, there are exceptions, but for example, in a country like Denmark, it is still one of the questions, the, the top question asked from some of these uh, hotlines um, that are providing information to girls. Um, one of the top questions is about menstruation, actually the top question. So even in a country like Denmark with reasonable education, um, it's still an issue. So yes, it's a problem. Uh, secondly, there's some evidence that um, the, um, the people who would be most likely to teach girls, the teachers, the mothers, feel that they are ashamed to teach about it or is shy and have not got the right, uh, the right knowledge to do so. There's also some evidence that actually they would like to know this and that um, different stakeholders have different priorities. You know, if it's AIDS people, they want to teach the girls about AIDS, whereas in the projects we have with Womena in uh, Uganda, the questions that the girls ask the most are about menstrual irregularities. They're very worried about all these irregularities and that should also, and as uh, Dr. Chandra has said, um, has found, they're often afraid to ask about this. So uh, I'm not the first to say this, but this does seem to be a possible neutral and demanded entry point for broader education. And broader education means not just you know, teaching girls about how to use a menstrual pad, but also all, some of all the other issues and possibly also longer term implications. Not just the girl who's in menarche, but also the adult woman. What about menopause? What about even after menopause? I can tell you from personal experience that life does exist after menopause. So a broader uh, view of it. Second possible entry point for as far as I can see it uh, is with respect to early marriage. And here we have, for example, in the context of um, uh, Girls Not Brides, that is the, the movement against early marriage, you have a, a prominent person such as President Museveni of Uganda saying that he thinks that one of the best ways to address early marriage is to make sure that both the parents and, the, and their children have information that menarche is not an absolute sign that now you have to get married. Third point has to deal with um, contraception. I must admit, that was the um, thing that brought my attention to this issue. My daughter and so her colleague were doing research in Uganda to figure out why was the unmet need so high, that is between the women who were in uh, need of a contraception, said they didn't want to get pregnant, and the ones who were using it. Why was the re reason for that? 40%. And one of the things they found, and the conventional wisdom at the time was, this is because there aren't enough products, the availability is bad. What they found was that it was the fear of the women about the side effects, in particular ir menstrual irregularities. That was the top reason. And this is confirmed by other studies on IUDs, uh, where women feel that they have too heavy uh, bleeding from some of the kinds of IUDs, and therefore they need too many pads, and they cost too much, and they stop. And this is confirmed by broader studies, by, for example, Guttmacher Institute, which says that 26% of all unmet need is actually due to fear of side effects, with irregular menstruation being one of the top ones. So I think that's a very important linkage to um, 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 uh, uh, reproductive health. My fourth point is about products and supplies. And I think many in the room, including myself, <laughs> uh, realize that this is something we've talked a lot about, and maybe too much attention has gone to that. But yet, 
products are important. What I think we need to have, though, is some nuancing of it or some expansion of our ideas about it. Number one, the, um, I've looked at a lot of financial uh, market analyses, and this is a very big market. Uh, it's something estimated about $30 billion a year, uh, growing at about 6% per year. The growth markets are in Africa and in Asia. In the West, it is stagnant or declining, much more than population growth. So there's nothing inherently, and most of those, of course, are disposable pads, something like two thirds. So there's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing inherently wrong, but we need to be aware of it, and it needs to be part of the of the equation, as it were. The second thing is that I have yet to see a very clear comparison of the different kinds of products. You have partial things, Path has put out something very useful, uh, you have, but then you have comments like, this product uses more water than that one without really having the evidence base, or this uh, product is safer than that one without having a complete picture. It would be good to me, I, I think, to have a, um, agreed criteria, including issues about disposal. Um, because otherwise, you cannot have informed choice. Let me give an example. Uh, in many of the family planning programs I have worked in, you have, as an obvious thing, that you go into the clinic and you have on the wall five different methods of family planning contraception, and you have the advantages and disadvantages of each. So the women walk in and they say, whoa, I have the agency to choose this. And no longer is it only the service provider who's making the choice. They have a choice maybe of some methods they hadn't heard about before. This makes a big difference. I think we have to realize that choice is not choice unless it is informed. Let me give you one example. Studies from India, there are many studies from India. You can see that there's a certain pattern, at least I seem to recognize, that the um, service provider of the health sector thinks uh, disposable pads are the best, they are the most hygienic. The women actually are quite interested in um, reusable pads because they're less costly. And the engineers, on the other hand, are very interested in um, some products that would be less problem with disposal, for example, disposable pads or cups, because uh, they would have less plastic that they would have to take care of, less volume that they would have to take care of. This is something that is also starting to interest countries in Africa. Look at Kenya, which has um, banned plastic bags. So I think this is also important to get this wide picture. Last point was on the humanitarian situations. Now, let me give an example. There was an earthquake in Nepal a few years ago, and you had something like six million people affected. They would have needed one million pads a day if they were to be, if their needs were to be met on that issue. That's a lot of pads to finance, to produce, to distribute, and to dispose of. And I spoke to somebody from the Nepal Red Cross who said this was impossible. They tried to import a machine to actually produce them themselves, but found out that actually the quality and the price were not that great. So they gave up. So yes, I think the whole issue of dignity kits and pre-preparing, um, that you have packages for sending out in situations like that, was a splendid idea, the getting attention to the issue. But I think we all agree now that we have to look at different emergency situations. It's very different if you're working after that, you have refugees in a camp in Tanzania who have been there for 20 years. Then the issues become, you know, how do you get sustainable into this? How do you get sustainability into it? And I was thinking you might use the MISP, so-called, the Minimum Initial Service Package for Reproductive Health in Emergencies, which starts out by saying, we need a coordinator. And then you have all the products that you, or the uh, services that you need to provide, and then you have the sustainability issue as the fifth point. So just a thought about how to look at the emergency situations also. So that's the end of it. I just wanted to show you this slide, which I love. The young Ugandan girls jumping into the air, just like the uh, Maasai warriors in, in uh, Kenya. Thank you very much.